Let me pray and we'll get into God's word. Father, we thank you for Jesus who did pay it all, who freely gave of himself, who took on human flesh and limited himself and died on a cross for our sake. And calls us to take up our cross daily and follow him. It calls us to bear each other's burdens. To care for one another inside and outside of the church. That your name might be praised. Go before us this morning as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's March. March is a number of things. March is spring beginning, spring break for many of you. March madness. Baylor Bears looking good over here. I'm not going to the other road down the, down the street. We're not going there. March for me, though, is also something else. It's the start of seasonal allergies. Anybody share that wonderful burden? Start of seasonal allergies. About the end of February, my eyes, the itching of my eyes. I wake up to my eyes itching. I wake up to my nose, and it all is just a mess up there. And so I don't know what kind of cocktail you use to deal with that, um, but I have a combination of different things that I've used over the years that works for me. We often share those things with one another to help uh, each other out. But seasonal allergies, uh, it's better in Houston than it was in Central Texas where I grew up, but it's still a thing for me. And about 10 years ago, my wife introduced me to something new, essential oils. And some of you laugh, but you use them. You know you use them. And so my introduction to this uh, was, okay, sweetie, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to throw in some lemon and some lavender and some peppermint, and we're going to mix this concoction up, and you're going to breathe it in. And I was super hesitant. I made fun of the whole thing. Y'all, I'm a believer, all right? (laughs) I, it's part of the cocktail, but I'm a believer in essential oils, at least as it relates to my allergies. I breathe this stuff thing, this stuff in, and magical things happen. It clears my airways. If you haven't tried it, maybe you should try it. But the question is, are they really named correctly? Are they essential? There's some people that think they're essential for all things. No lie, this is a true story. I was at a baptismal a number of years ago for our church. Previous church I was at, baptismal. People got dunked, and then after the baptismal, in the pool at someone's house, it was celebration, kids were swimming, a lot of kids in a small pool. And one of my really good friends' kids jumped in the pool from top shelf and landed on his brother. Well, he landed on his brother, and he gashed open completely his forehead. There was blood going everywhere, and he, he's coming up to his kid, and there's this woman in our church, and she's busted out. I'm telling you, she's busted out the frankincense, and she's got it on her hand, and she's about to put it on this kid's head, and my friend, who is a soft-spoken, doesn't get, he, he just doesn't go there. He hates conflict. He grabs the arm and's like, what are you doing? Everybody's like, yeah, this will fix it. You don't need frankincense in that case. Maybe you need myrrh almost in that kind of place. But I'm telling you, she thought that that was going to cure his problem. And she's like, and and my buddy said, look, we've got to take him to the urgent care. And he doesn't need essential oils right now. He needs stitches. That's essential right now. And then maybe later we put some frankincense on this deal. Essential. Is it essential? You know, we've been studying the book of Romans. And the first 11 chapters Paul deals with what is essential, the stitches we need because of our sin. And he's dealt with those things and told us about the beautiful stitch of the gospel, how it heals and how it brings life. And then from chapters 12 all the way to 16, you see the application of that. And in view of God's mercies, in view of the gospel truths, how do we live our lives? How do we live our lives in front of God? How do we live our lives with one another in the church, outside the church, with our enemies, toward the government? And then he comes to 14, and he's like, well, what about the non-essentials, essential oils? What about the things that aren't essential? How do we navigate those things with one another? Because what often happens, and I think this is just built in to the sinful human heart, we tend to major in the minors, right? We, we tend to make non-essential things essential. We put them on that plane. We get more passionate about non-essential things than we do about essential things. 
like the gospel and God's word, clear commands of scripture, and we focus on the non-essentials. That's our struggle. Sometimes we are bent in non-essential ways where we major in the minors and we live in these ditches. And the problem of it is, is that we break gospel unity that we ought to maintain, as Brent so put it well last week. How do we deal with unity in the midst of diversity? Essentials. What is your bent? Is it your bent to layer on to other people what I would call your offenses that you have for your own life? Do you layer those on to other people? Are you just the libertine, the libertine that looks at life and says, I'm free to do whatever I want? What's your bent? Do you tend to go over and around and through other people to pursue the path that you think God has given you because Christ has laid his life down for you, that you are free? Is free autonomous? Is liberty self-autonomy? Paul's going to deal with that in Romans chapter 14 this morning, second part of this. Romans 14, and we'll start in verse 13, and we'll go all the way to chapter 15, verse 1. Some of you are going, 15 verse what? 15 verse 1, that's as far as we're going. Page 949, there should be some Bibles next to you on, a, on your row, on your chair there if you don't have one, but we want you to look along. And we're going to look at non-essentials, and I want to say that up front. We're talking about non-essentials. We're not talking about essentials today, and it's important that we look at that and understand that, because here's the situation. In the first century church, there are Christian Jews who has spent much of their lives following the Old Testament law, dietary laws. And as Brent said last week, they were having a struggle with being free to eat what they want. They, they, they couldn't eat pork chops because they had spent their whole life and their family had spent their whole life and before them and before them and before them for all this time obeying the Old Testament laws. And Jesus comes along and frees them from that and fulfills the law. And Paul and Peter are saying, kill and eat, it's okay. And they're struggling with that. Their actions haven't caught up with their knowledge. They're new Christians. They know they are free, but they're having struggle. They're struggling with being willing to eat something like meat sacrificed to idols, for example, in the market. They're struggling with that. And you have these Gentile Christians in the Roman church, and they are free. They understand their freedom. And so Paul uses the idea of weak and strong. And that's not necessarily weak in the sense of spiritual immaturity or strong in the sense of spiritual maturity. There's some implications there that we'll get to. But how do we deal with one another on non-essentials that you see one way and that person over here sees a different way? Well, I'm always going to sit on this side of church because they, the people over there, they're about these other non-essentials and we're about this. How do you navigate life through those things? Romans 14, 13 through chapter 13, 13 and, and, and 4 it gives us three things, I think. It gives us three action steps toward gospel unity in the church with non-essentials. One of those is for both the strong and the weak and the other one is directed at the strong, the one who has liberty. The one who doesn't seed food that way, for example. The one is free and has more liberty. So let me read it. 14, 13, and following. Verse 13, chapter 14. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block, underline that, or hindrance, underline that, in the way of a brother, I know I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in its, of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. There's some ambiguity there we'll talk about. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy or harm the one who Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking However, contrast, but of righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Verse 20, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. 
It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between, stronger brother, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So three things. The first one is this, be mindful. First thought, be mindful not to entrap or trip up one another. Look at it there in verse 13, where he uses two phrases. He uses the phrase stumbling block or hindrance. Some people look at these as interchangeable, but if you go dig a little deeper and you look at the Greek and these two words, they are similar, but they are distinct. And he's been talking about the weaker brother, the one who is limited in what he will eat or the days that he will observe. And the other is the strong, effectively. Chapter 15, verse 1, we're strong, have an obligation to bear the failings of the weak, and do not, so we don't please ourselves. So he uses these two ideas, and I think they're a, a little bit distinct. The word we get for stumbling block is scandalon. And it's the word that is used in a picture of like a baited trap that has meat on it. It'd be like in the first century if someone who could, was free to eat this meat that we were talking about last week, that had been sacrificed to idols, which some people said, hey, I can't touch that. The free, here's where it would be wrong. The free in the Roman church goes to the market and goes and buys some pork chops and he comes home and he calls up, not that they could do that back then, he calls up, he texts the Jewish believer who struggles and he invites him over for dinner, he breaks out the pellet grill and he makes some pork chops and says, hey, this is gonna be your first pork chop ever. You smell it, isn't it so great? That's setting a trap for the weak brother. That stumbling block, scandal into this baited trap. Let's say you're like a German Lutheran, all right? You're a German Lutheran and your family ends up at a Baptist, little Baptist church in Magnolia, Texas. And you get on the communion team, you're a German Lutheran. And one day you just decide to do it. I'm going to put wine. Instead of juice, that grape juice, that Welch's grape juice in there. And I'm just going to see all these Baptist ladies squirm. I don't have to watch a cup today. <laughs> That's setting a trap, y'all. Don't use your freedom in that way. And then the other word we get for hindrance, do you see it there? Proskuma. It's literally a trip hazard. The idea of a trip hazard, to trip someone up. You ever been in class, and I know none of you have done this, but have you ever been in class and there's a kid walking by and just happy as can be and you just stick your foot out like that, trip them up? That's what this is. Don't trip up. So if you're someone who is more limited in what you approve in your conscience and non-essential things, for the strong who is free, it's like tripping them up. And if you are strong and you have liberty in an area, whether it's drinking or whatever it is, you shouldn't be entrapping the weak in ways that it would hurt their faith, in ways that it would damage their faith. Do you see this? See, then Paul gives, and look at the next verse there, he, he gives a defense, effectively, of everything's clean. Like if you read the New Testament and you read and acts, and you continue to read, you look at Jesus, like, this food is clean. It's not what's on the outside that makes you defiled or unclean. It's what comes out of you that makes you defiled or unclean. So these people are having to deal with their consciences. So Paul clarifies that, but then for the rest of this text that we're in, he's talking to the stronger brother or sister about how they go about their liberty and their freedom. And look at it. So he says, hey, it's, it's, it's clean. There's nothing that you put inside yourself that's unclean, but for the one who thinks it is, it's unclean for them. Let it be. And so he goes on and says, if you don't do that, if you set a trap or a stumbling block, you are not walking in love. Christ calls us to walk 
and love toward one another that we don't get to abuse the freedoms that we have. And then he uses a phrase that says destroy. It says it a couple of times, and it's just the idea of harm. It's not that they lose their salvation. That's not what it is. It just harms another Christian and their relationship with Christ. It harms it. And he's saying, walk in love, because, man, Christ died for this person. And, yeah, maybe they can't show up to Deacon Baldy's and have a drink with you. But Christ died for them. And you need to be careful about how you interact and how you love them. So here's the point. Don't cause a blood-brought brother or sister in Christ to sin by putting a trap in front of them. And if you're weaker and you have more limitations of yourself, don't judge a stronger brother. Don't trip them up. So he's kind of speaking to both sides of the fence here. Galatians 5 helps us with this, another place that I just want to show you. Galatians 5, I've got it up here. Galatians 5, Paul's saying Christ has set you free. And he's specifically dealing with this thing that was true in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant of Jewish people and proselyte Jews needing to be circumcised, the males needing to be circumcised, and they're making a thing about it in the New Testament. And Paul's like, stop it. Stop doing this. Your brother is free. They don't have to be circumcised. And he comes down here and he says in verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only, there's a catch, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through what? Love. Serve one another. Just because you're free not to be circumcised, Gentiles, doesn't mean you flaunt your freedom to Jews. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Wow. Walk in love. Even if somebody's actions haven't caught up yet to the knowledge that they have. Let me give you an example of why it's important, why not just knowledge is important, but patient love is important with somebody other than you. I want you all to think back, if you can, like your earliest memory, like second, two years old, one year, whatever it is, at night, when your mom and dad tucked you in at night, and the room is now dark, and you're a little, little kid, and you know that there's not a monster under your bed You know that there's not a monster in the closet, but you still think there is. And you call out to either mom or dad, whoever's nicer, right? Whoever's going to be the person that shows you a little bit more compassion. You call out to them, mom, dad, I'm scared. There's a monster under my bed. And so, as a parent, what does that parent need to do? Is that parent, here's some options, okay? The parent walks in the room and says, you're really tired sometimes. This is hard. Walks in the room and says, you know there's not a monster under your bed. Go to sleep. Boom. That's one option. Or you go, you know there's not a monster under the bed, but I'm going to show you scary. And you go get your Chucky hat and you show them scary, right? <laughs> you put, right? Nobody, nobody does it, right? Siblings do that. My son's got this panda hat. Watch out. Or you do something else. Sweetie, why don't we pray? I know you're scared. I know you think monsters are in the room. Hey, let's turn on the light. Is there a monster under there? Is there a monster in the closet? No. Okay, there's not a monster. But you're afraid. And you break out Psalm 56. Let's sing it. When I am afraid, I will trust thee. What are you doing? And maybe you even lay down for a minute. I, I remember my mom coming in, not my dad for sure. Like squeezing the hand. They can't get away. And they'd stay for a couple minutes and leave. There are other problems on the other end of that, I know. But that's what that child needs. That's what the weaker needs. They need a wiser, older mom, dad, to treat them with kid gloves, to help them with their knowledge. They know there's not a monster in their bed or they're in their closet. They need you to be patient 
and love them and walk with them and teach them. It's the same thing that we need to do. If you are free in an area that someone else isn't, you've got to put on your kid gloves sometimes to help them grow. So let me ask you, if you're more free and you have freedom in these non-essentials, man, are you, are you extending that kind of grace to somebody else and care and love to somebody else? And if you are more limited in non-essentials and you tend to be more restricted in ways, you got to give the stronger the benefit of the doubt sometimes too and not judge them because they have a take. Remember, we're talking about non-essentials, not the essentials of the gospel. But his, the, this whole thing is challenging, and it's hard to describe every scenario, but here's why this thing is challenging. Because these are heart issues, aren't they? Oftentimes, the more free, oftentimes, the more free, if I wanted to stereotype it, the tendency for the more free is often to, to take essentials and move them as far as you can to non-essentials. Right, the free bird. And the temptation of the weak that's limiting and needs control for themselves and others, the temptation is also the opposite, to make everything essential, even the non-essentials. And these are struggles. What's your bent? Is your bent to make not essentials essentials to where everything's just as important as the next thing and you're going to die on every hill? Or the opposite, man, eh, I'm going to tweak that a little bit. The essential truth of the gospel that the word of God is inspired, it's authoritative, it's sufficient for life and godliness, eh, and you also need this other thing. So where you just make essentials more and more non-essential. Those are bents that we have. But let's do something for a minute. Let's just play this out because I've, I've kind of given you high-level stuff and the understanding, weak and strong, but let's just play this out for a minute. And you can be offended or happy, it doesn't matter, but I'm just going to play it out. This is dangerous. Let's take some things, all right? Yoga. I'm trying to stay as close as I can to the examples of meat sacrifice to idols and what some people think of them, what other people think of them, days, certain days of the year. So let's take yoga. Some people go, you know what? Nobody should do yoga because the origins of yoga are Eastern and Hindu, and it's bowing to the God within you, right? Namaste, that's what it means, to bow to the God within you. And the postures, I mean, my dog does downward dog, but those postures are meant for worship, a false God's worship. So I should stay as far away from yoga as possible. There's some people there, and that's fine. There are other people on the other side that would say, hey, I just need to stretch. I'm tight, my bones hurt, and I'm old, and I need a way to stretch. And I don't bow to the God. I don't feel like I'm bowing to the God within me and any of that. I just need a good stretch. And I, maybe I don't assume that kind of position, but I, need, I just need to, some good stretches, okay? If it's not that, give me something. So what do you do? The, the issue isn't your take. The issue is what you tell the other person on the other side. If you're the free person over here, you're going, man, you're just crazy and weird. Get over it. And oh, by the way, I'm showing up at your house. I'm going to start doing yoga. Bring my block. And the other side is tripping up, right? You got to stop it. I saw that post on social media where you're at that place doing yoga. That's sinful and it's wrong. There's probably more in between that, isn't there? I had that discussion the other day. We sat down to lunch. We had this discussion. The other day with somebody. Let me give you another one. Halloween. Ah, it's fun. There are some people who are convinced and their conscience is convinced. Listen, that's the devil's day. I'm not giving the devil anything. And we're going to do what Christians do. We're going to do the fall festival, dadgummit. <laughs> right? I'm down for the fall festival. We'll do the fall festival. That's fine. Fall festival. And you know what? Come Halloween night, lights off. Not interacting with anybody, right? And that's fine. That's, that's one take. And there are people who have come out of, for example, like the occult or something, and there's right and good reasons for their conscience to go, nope, not doing it. The other side is this. 
Um, every day is God's day. It's his. He's sovereign over it. And this is the one day of the year that my neighbors who never come out, who don't know Jesus, come out of their homes. And that eight-foot fence and that garage that shuts, now they want to hang out. And you know what? I'm going to pull up a spot up here. And I want to say there's a fire pit, but in October, he's usually on a fire pit. And we're going to hang out, and we're going to welcome all these different kids, whether we're in, like, Superman outfit or the Dawn of the Dead, we're going to welcome them. And we're going to give them candy, and we're going to meet our neighbors. Two very different takes. Or maybe there's people in the middle who's like, hey, I'm not wearing, my kids aren't wearing that, but they're going to go out and trick or treat in our neighborhood. And they're wearing Wonder Woman and Iron Man, and I'm getting some candy out of the deal. <laughs> so these kinds of things. A certain day, right? We, we look at a certain day differently than one another. That's kind of like the days that they're observing, right? And man, maybe you have a strong take on one side or the other side, and that's okay. It's okay. Have it. Conscientiously have it. However, when we start rolling to the other side and saying, nope, sinful and wrong, or nope, you're weird, that's crazy, you need to use your freedom, that's when we got problems. That's when unity is challenged. And the gospel is bigger than that. It needs to be bigger than that in our lives. So don't entrap or trip one another up. That's what, we're, that's what he's saying here. But maybe you need a matrix. Maybe you need some high-level principles, right, to help you go, well, when, do I, when are things essential and non-essential? How do I make those kinds of decisions? It's great. Paul gives us some thoughts here. Verse 15 through 20, look at it. Verse 15, or excuse me, verse 15 to 20, specifically verse 17. Look at verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. What are eating and drinking? They're external things. You put those things in. They're external. They're not internal. They're external. But here's a contrast. Here's what the kingdom of God is not. It's not just about externals, but righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. So your second thought is this. Prioritize. You need a matrix. Here it is. To help you navigate non-essentials, here it is. Prioritize. Eternals, not externals. Drinking. Eating. External things. It's not what goes into the body that defiles you. It's what comes out. Jesus. And you know what the Pharisees said at that point? I'm offended. They had all their fences. They were offended by this. And the issue in that passage in Matthew 15 was that the disciples weren't washing their hands. And that wasn't the Old Testament law. That was their traditions. And Jesus spoke into their traditions and said, it's not, it's not a thing. They were offended. So we got to prioritize eternal things over external things. Kingdom things. And what are the kingdom things here? Look at it. The kingdom things here are righteousness. You know what comes out of righteousness? Peace and joy. Jesus said it this way. Sermon on the Mount. And he's dealing with anxious people and people worried about things. He's dealing with that. And he says what? But seek first his kingdom and what else? His righteousness. And all these things will be granted to you. What are all these things in that context? All these things are peace instead of worry and joy. And Galatians tells us that the fruit of the Spirit, right? Peace and joy. And so you need a matrix. Is it a kingdom issue or is it not a kingdom issue? And that's a great thing to apply to non-essentials. That's a great thing to apply when you're arguing in marriage, or you're arguing with your parents. Is, is this a kingdom issue? Or is it not a kingdom issue? I don't know about you, but I, I, I want to argue about all kinds of things that aren't kingdom issues. And sometimes we just have to let it go. Look at it here, and here, here's what it produces. Kingdom issues, pursuing kingdom issues, you know what it produces? The church being built up. Do you see it there? Mutual upbuilding. Do you know what non-essentials, like externals, 
You know what they end up doing if we focus on them, if we major in those kind of minors? Tears down. We argue about the silliest of things. And maybe it's important to you, but you can't put all your eggs in those kinds of baskets. It's a whole lot easier to tear down, though, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier and quicker for a building to come down than it is to be built up. And that's the air we breathe. Every, the the world you live in tells you in every algorithm, hate that person because of this thing. The problem is, is that if we break fellowship, for example, inside the church over smaller things, you're just going to be left playing in your own sandbox and nobody's going to be there. This verse, look at it. This is important. Um, This verse we see, verse 20. I want you to look at it. Do not for the sake of blank. Here it's food. That's the example. Don't tear down the work of God for food. That's what was going on then. Do you know how many things we could put in that sentence? Fill in the blank. Do not tear down the work of God for food. Parenting philosophy, school choices, strategy within a ministry, a men's ministry, a women's ministry, a community agreement, the strategy, the way that we do ministry. Don't tear it down for that. Worship style, family integrated or not, political nuance. I've just got this list. Mask, vaccines, best practices that, to deal with injustices, how you relate to the person in Conroe or Montgomery or Magnolia or the Woodlands, how you relate to one another. Man, we're in the fusion of it. We've got to figure this thing out. tattoos, music, you name it. There's all kinds of non-essentials that could easily fall in that blank. Do not for the sake of any of those things, and you could come up with more. Destroy the work of God. Have you ever, uh, you ever heard the name Allen Iverson? Allen Iverson, sorry, some of you checked out. He's a basketball guy. And you already really checked out. Like, I don't care about basketball. Sorry, you're stuck with me. Allen Iverson, Hall of Fame, point guard, shooting guard, Philadelphia 76ers, tatted up guy. We're not talking about that. Um, Hall of Famer. Short guy, played in the 90s, 2000s. And man, when you, you play basketball in the NBA and that day, I mean, that's like playing real dodgeball. I know they don't play real dodgeball anymore, but people, people got hurt for driving the lane. Little guy. And he laid it. The thing about Allen Iverson, love him or hate him, he always laid it on the line. Like, he would drive the lane and get just ripped up and hurt all the time. And if you know the name Allen Iverson, you probably associate him with a a certain interview. An interview where the reporter was basically saying, hey, why aren't you showing up for practice? Sometimes the coach is even saying, you don't show up for practice. And this is not a commentary, by the way, on practice. You should show up for practice if you got to practice. But what does he say? The whole interview, five minutes long. 22 times, he says, man, this is practice. We're talking about practice. And he's pointing to his game on the court. Listen. When we come to a text like this, I think Paul is saying to these Roman believers, let it be. Don't argue about practice. The non-essentials. And maybe we need a list. Could we come up with, you want to come up with a list? Let's compare lists and see whose is what. That would be fun. But sometimes we got to let it go. Paul's saying all this food is absolutely clean, but there are some people around you that are going to stumble. So let them be, strong believer. Let them be. Respect that. Make provision for that, for them. If they're weak, In that area, don't flaunt your freedom. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. See, unity through love is more important for the body of Christ. Amen? So, a couple things here. What makes for gospel unity? Focus on the externals. Eternals, not externals. That one's hard. Don't entrap or trip each other up. One more, though. A couple verses at the end here. There's something you got to realize. You got to realize 
that sometimes liberty, sometimes liberty has its limits. Liberty has its limits. Look at the way the Apostle Paul, God's word set, talks about these limits for the stronger brother, the one who is free. He says everything is indeed clean, however, it is wrong. Paul says it's wrong. For what? For anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Just don't do it in front of them. It is good not to eat meat and drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And then he gives like three things to help us walk this tightrope of liberty. He says everything is clean, but it's wrong. And then verse 22, the, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Be confident where you're at. Like if you're the stronger brother and you feel the freedom to drink an alcoholic beverage at some point, be free to do that. Be confident in that. But don't lord it over your brother. Be, be confident. But be considerate. If you're with somebody who just got out of AA and they're trying to get through something, maybe you don't drink that beer in front of them, right? Maybe you don't do that. I'll tell you a, a short story. When, when I was in college, I came to faith when I was almost 21 years old, which was a good thing. I had some stuff in my life, and drinking was one of them. And I came to faith, and I was like the, the legalist for a couple of years. Well, if I can't drink, nobody else should drink either. Um, but, but I just struggled with that. I was the weaker brother in that. And there were other brothers who were free. I know they were free now when I look back, but they limited their freedom for the sake of my faith. For the sake of what, and guess what else they did? They, they spoke into it. They challenged me. They encouraged me to where my conscience was able to grow. Because I think that's true. Our consciences do need to grow in these areas. But you know what? Today, if we sat down and we met up, I don't have any problem having a beer with them because my conscience has changed a little bit, and that happens in life. But they were gracious to limit their own freedom for me, a weak, young believer that needed people to walk and treat me with kid gloves. They needed that, and we have to be that for others. Man, culture in our world today, Christian freedom is often seen even in the church, it's often seen as self-autonomy. We live in a broader culture that says, you can't tell me what to do. There's no rights and wrong. If I decide something, therefore it's right and wrong, so there's no correction of anything in our, in our world, and that tends to seep into the church as well. And listen, there are plenty of places in our world and in the church, and you can listen to podcast after podcast of people in power and leadership where they abuse that power and they abuse that leadership onto people and there's real abuse, all kinds of abusive things that happen. That is one ill of our day. But there's another one and it's an opposite one and it's just as big of a problem. And, and the problem in secular ideology in that is if I never do anything wrong and someone in my Christian community says, hey, consider this. Consider that you might not need to do that. There's iron sharpening iron. And oftentimes and sometimes, if you believe that you are free because Christ has made you free to be autonomous and nobody can tell you what to do in the Christian community, then you're in for a lot of challenge. We need one another. We need to hold each other accountable. We need to repent for sin. And oftentimes it's stuff that we can't see rather than responding with, you're oppressing me, or you're abusing me. I know two situations right now in churches where I believe in the character of people in a situation where there's someone that's saying, that person has oppressed me, that person is shaming me, rather than going, hey, they're trying to help you grow. And again, I'm gonna come back to it. There is an absolute problem in our world of people being oppressed. It's true, it's right, but there's also the opposite problem. And it builds out of self-autonomy to think, I'm right no matter if I'm wrong. Nobody can tell me that this is wrong because I've decided this. It's an important distinction as we think about liberty and what it is and freedom for what it really is as opposed to autonomy. There are limits that God has given us. Can I ask you the question, in what specific ways could you consider limiting your own liberty 
to serve someone else, to help their faith grow. Maybe that's in your own home with your kids and what they see you watching or drinking or any of those things. That's been convicting to me. And maybe it's at work. Maybe it's not just for the sake of other believers. Maybe it's for the sake of people that are watching you out there that don't know Jesus and what kind of example you're setting in a world. So in what ways do you need to to limit yourself? And maybe you say, I understand all this, but you know what? I'm free. Jesus has made me free. You know what else Jesus has done? He made you free by limiting his own power and authority. He died on a cross for you and for me, not because he deserved it, but because we deserved it. He limited himself. He took our sin upon himself. He took up his cross for us. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the mystery of the gospel. That's the truth of the gospel. If he's willing to do it, we ought to follow suit. Take up your cross, as he said, and what? Follow me. Lay it down. Sometimes we have to lay down our rights. Sometimes we have to yield. And the greatest example of that is Jesus himself, right? So how do we pursue gospel unity in the church? Don't trip each other up. Prioritize eternals, not externals. Realize that sometimes you gotta yield. Some situations, not all, and you're not gonna do that perfectly, but sometimes we have to yield. Sometimes we have to limit ourselves. There's a story of a guy who was a tightroper, Walker, tightrope walker, and New York City, 1974, August 7th, 110 stories up, the World Trade Center's then, guy from France of all places, crazy people from France, right? Felipe Pettit, 25-year-old French tightropist, he walked on this thing, 140 feet between, steel cable for 45 minutes. He walked across it, he danced across it, he did all kinds of stuff, and he finally surrendered himself to the New York police, and when pulled off, he said, yeah, my friends told me I, I may need you know, a harness, but I, I wanted to be free. I wanted to experience the freedom and the rush of this adrenaline junkie on a tightrope without anything except he had a balancing pole. This is what tightrope walkers use. It's a 55-pound balancing pole, so as he walks across the span in his freedom, that this balancing pole keeps him on the pole, or on the line. You know, that's a great picture of Romans 14, that we have freedom. God has given us freedom in non-essentials, and we have differences of opinions on non-essential things. There's great freedom in that. Christ has died to set us free. And yet that freedom has a balance. So as we walk this tightrope of freedom and liberty, know that we have to have balance. We need this balancing pole of self-control, of thought toward others as Jesus has died for us. So here's your takeaway this morning, C3. There's a balance in this. Here's your takeaway. In essentials, there's unity. There's always got to be unity around the essentials of God's word. So if you open God's word and there is a command and a truth, the truth of the gospel message, the truth that the Bible is authoritative and sufficient, we could go on and on and on. Go look at our doctrinal statement. There has to be unity around right doctrine and truth that is unequivocal. We don't bend on those things. We don't make essentials non-essentials. So in essentials, there's unity. But in non-essentials, there is liberty. And the truth of the matter is, is when we push on that, it's usually our pride that's pushing. Well, they can't think that because they're wrong and I'm right. Therefore, I'm biblical and they're not. In non-essentials, liberty. And so if You are the more limiting brother. You need to let the free be free and not trip them up. And if you were stronger, there's a lot of admonition here about how you limit your freedom for the sake of your brother and sister in Christ. I think Paul's doing this, though. I don't think spiritual maturity is primarily about weak or stronger. You hear that language and you go, weak Christian, strong Christian? I think a spiritually maturing believer 
is the person who recognizes. How do I treat the weaker brother? Am I considering them? How do I treat the stronger brother? Is it judgment or is it letting them be? We need to have the grace to let people be. So in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Let me pray.